Yeah, this session offers uh, 0.75 uh, core competency and 0.75 uh, uh, resource development CCU. So uh, please stay on until the end of the session uh, if you need to uh, claim your CCU certificates. With that, let me introduce our topic and our speaker for today. We have with us Fernando once again, who spoke to us a couple of weeks ago about trauma-informed coaching. It was such an enriching session. I kept on getting compliments in terms of the quality of the session, the engagement, the interaction, the presence and the connection people had with the session. So thank you, Fernando. And I think that has generated lots of enthusiasm. We will have a big crowd today again, looking forward to a phenomenal session. Um, Right after the introductions, I will share the link to the previous session too, the recorded version in case people would want to listen to it. A bit about Fernando, then I will talk about the topic also. Fernando is an ICF MCC, an alternate multidisciplinary therapist with over 20 plus years of experience. He introduced the first psychedelic integration professional coaching qualification, blending coaching science, psychology and psychedelic integration. He integrates therapeutic approaches, professional coaching, and vipassana into his practice. And as an educator, mentor, and supervisor, he guides individuals towards personal and professional growth. Outside his work, he enjoys meditation and salsa. Fernando sees himself as an empathetic catalyst for the growth of professionals and organizations. All his learning and development interventions are founded on the belief that every individual possesses infinite innate wisdom to foster a thriving and fulfilling professional and personal life. Boasting 18 years of experience, over 4,000 hours of documented coaching and therapy, Fernando caters to a diverse and global clientele. Uh, this includes students, professionals, leaders, influencers from all backgrounds and organizations driven by transformation. With that, we are very honored to have you here with us today, Fernando. A little bit about the topic before I hand it over to you. Um, the title of today's session is Coaching Beyond the Conscious Mind, Psychedelic Integration Coaching. In Hindi, we have a phrase, and we say, Bas naam hi kafi hai, which translates to the name itself suffices. And it is so true for this session. In this session, we will be on a journey with Fernando to discover the transformative, po transformative power of psychedelic coaching. Today's session explores how the fusion of psychedelic integration and coaching can unlock dimensions of personal development and self-transformation. Supported by leading institutions like Harvard, uh, John Hopkins, uh, and Imperial College London, this session invites all of us to learn how to harness these groundbreaking techniques for true reinvention and growth. With that, I invite uh, Fernando to take us on this amazing journey. Over to you, Fernando. Thank you, Shanti. Hi, everyone. I am so deeply honored to be here in your presence. So I would like to thank each and every one of you for showing up. You could be doing something else, but I believe as a professional coach and individual who is looking to expand your awareness, your consciousness, uh, your development, um, you are here to participate and co-create with us. So I honor your presence. And as I always say, I hope that I'll be able to share with you some gifts that you can take with you and immediately embody and implement in your life. And even more importantly, we are all in a profession that we all could call a privilege, which is coaching and enabling other people's expansion. So I hope that some of the uh, insights that, that would be created during this uh, session today would also empower your clients as well. And also, it is such an honor to uh, co-create with ICF Bangalore chapter. And I would like to be deeply grateful and thankful to the leadership team for having me and having all of you here today. So let's dive in, uh, coaches. So I hope you don't mind me calling you coaches since it is a coaching event. And uh, so let's, uh, let's get started. Let's dive in. <clears throat> I'll share my screen with all of you. So as I'm sharing, thank you. Uh, as I'm sharing my screen, I only see myself and the screen. So if you have any questions, feel free to send them in the chat room uh, so that we can attend to them. So let's get started. As uh, Shanti mentioned, um, when we hear the word psychedelics, there are many 
uh, aspects to it. Some people are mesmerized by the word, knowing the power of psychedelics. And I also have noticed a smaller percentage becoming a little bit unsettled with the word psychedelics because there's also stigma attached to uh, certain ways of approaching psychedelics, which yeah. is understandable. Uh, however, so as uh, Shanti introduced, I would like to mention uh, this discussion is centered around our psychedelic integration, trauma-informed psychedelic integration coach practitioner program, which is accredited by the International Coaching Federation. So with that, then you are recognizing that there's professional credibility and we are here with a mindful intention to um, destigmatize uh, power of possibility uh, in creating uh, value impact and expansion in our people, in our clients, ourselves, right? So coaching beyond the conscious mind, psychedelic integrated coaching. So let's dive in and try to understand what we mean by uh, coaching beyond the conscious mind and also how psychedelic enables that possibility. So before we begin, uh, if there are highly sensitive individuals, I would like to mention uh, in this session, not so much, but in our previous session, we had certain elements of sexual abuse, self-harm, violence, and disorders. So if you are a highly sensitive individual, I will be talking about a few things. Uh, so uh, engage with caution. And then uh, being responsible, uh, I would also like to mention that this session solely intends education and harm reduction purposes only. And then moving forward, what is our path today? Uh, I would like to invite you to co-create with me. So we will have a few uh, self-reflections. I think the entire session intends to be a self-reflective experience. Uh, and then there will be two group reflections where in each you will have two, three, four uh, maximum of uh, your colleagues. In case um, if you don't have your colleagues uh, interacting with you, feel free to uh, reflect by yourself. It's not necessary as such to really engage. If you can, that's great. Uh, and I would also say that uh, at the end of uh, your reflection, I would like to hear from one or two of you, the reason being that it's a large uh, audience uh, and let's maximize this 90 minutes. Uh, now it has become 80 minutes. So let's manage this time and create the maximum value. And then also uh, I would say when you share, avoid repetition and uh, be direct to the point. We are all professional coaches. We know how to speak uh, precisely. And then if you have any questions, feel free to them, send them in chat. Or if you have a burning question that you'd like to address, feel free to uh, come forward, raise your hand, and I will invite your attention. Uh, and if you would like to ask a question, let's make sure it's absolutely relevant to that specific uh, moment or the topic that we are addressing. So moving forward, our path today is to look at the neuroscience of transformation, uh, go a little bit deeper, and then I would like to introduce psychedelic integration to you very briefly. It's a vast topic. Uh, universities like Harvard, uh, Imperial College London, um, uh, John Hopkins, many universities, including universities in Thailand, are studying them. And also, I am very fortunate being in this specific uh, speciality uh, as a therapist and a coach now in Thailand. Very recently, uh, this year, they legalized, uh, especially psilocybin, this, the main uh, psychedelic that we will be addressing today. Uh, in Thailand for medicinal use and research purposes. So I find myself to be uh, absolutely so lucky to be in this space and share this space with you. So today I'm going to share with you some of my experiences with psychedelics. And um, it makes me quite vulnerable sometimes to share these experiences. My heart races, but I think it's important that you hear out true, real experiences. And then we will also look at very briefly what psych integrated coaching is. So diving in, coaches, the very first individual reflection I would like to invite all of you is, what does the word transformation mean to you? Often when we use the word, uh, when we uh, approach coaching, we say we are holistic, integrated, transformational coaches. If not, we often say that coaching creates transformation. It indeed does. So 
let's take a step back. What does the word transformation mean to you? Especially if you are using it as a marketing content. If you use the word transformation in your marketing content, I'm sure you have thought about it already. So what does that mean to you? If you feel free, uh, send them in the chat room for now. We will uh, keep it to chat room for now. While transformation is a really deep topic, since we are coaches, I'm sure we have addressed that. So we move on to the next reflection. An important question. Now, we as professional coaches understand what transformation is. But how about your clients? How do your clients define transformation? What I'm really inviting you to think about here is that when, you, when they hear the word transformation, when you mention maybe in your website or in your marketing content, what do they expect from you as transformation? So let's take a minute again, individual reflection. Feel free to send it in chat room. So I see breakthroughs, betterment, uh, positive change, change of beliefs, clarity, moving from current way of being to a new. So many sharings. And I think you are spot on change and clarity. So I keep seeing change, clarity, moving forward, uh, and so on. All right. So now I would like to uh, seek help from Shanti for creating a breakout room for five minutes with a one minute to come back, so altogether six minutes. And in this uh, group reflection, I would like to discuss with your colleagues as a professional coach, how do you create this transformation in your client? How many Shanti. people in a room, Fernando? Uh, three or four, Shanti. Sure. Yeah. As a professional coach, how do you create this transformation in your clients? And when you're back, let's hear from one or two groups. Thank you. The rooms are opening now. Oh, I did it. Sorry, sorry. Close. Not done it correctly. I created four rooms instead of four people in a room. I think that's all right. <laughs> Just closing the room so I can come back again. Yes. All right. Shanti, I was in room three. I don't know. I'll... Hold on, hold on. I uh, incorrectly created the breakout rooms. Give me 30 seconds. I will reassign rooms and send you back. Apologies, people. My fault. I created rooms incorrectly. I'm fixing it now. Uh, uh, breakout room three. Uh, could you kindly return us to the breakout room? I'm recreating the breakout been... rooms. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah.
Gita, you're not part of a breakout room? Uh, Shanti, does my laptop just hung up? So I, I'm trying to figure it out. I think room no 13 is what I'm assigned. I'll just go there. Thank no you for worries. checking. Veena, I understand you can't join. No worries. Please stay on. Uh, Sangamitra. Hi, lovely. Did you join just now? Do you want me to assign you to a breakout room? Yeah, I just joined. Let me assign you. Give me one second. Yeah, thank you. So we'll wait for everybody to be back and then now we can this. All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, Shanti, thank you for facilitating the breakout rooms. Uh, so coaches, if you didn't uh, really necessarily have the time to discuss this topic as it's a really a topic that requires depth of attention, it's perfectly all right. At the same time, if uh, one or two groups, a representative from each group would like to share a little bit of your insights, what came up, who would like to come forward? Sarah, I see that you raised your hand. Yeah, I think we had a very interesting um, discussion on different ways to get to that transformation. And one of the thoughts that came up by um, somebody in the team, I think by Pradeep, um, was that, you know, as a coach, we are not attached to the outcome. So the aim is not to get to transformation. Um, if that happens on the way, that's great. If not, it might happen in between two sessions um, where we actually you know, didn't do anything. It's just them getting that clarity. So I thought that very thought-provoking. <laughs> Indeed, thank you. So I see uh, Francine also raised hand. Would you like to go next? Uh, yeah, so, um, what I heard, like you heard very good things, but what I think it's more about the personal transformation of the coach himself as a catalyst of the deep transformation of our coaching. I think that's the key for me. We cannot, uh, we cannot go further with the client depending on where we are at our own transformation. But I picked on everything you share. The most important key. For me. Excellent. Thank you, Francine and the team for the discussion. Uh, let's take one uh, more insight. I see Viswanathana, would you like to share? Uh, sure. Uh, no, we kind of uh, resonated with an idea. Uh, what we felt is saying that uh, transformation cannot be brought in by an external force, however great that force is. It has to happen uh, when somebody chooses to exercise their own option with their own agency or a free will, right? So the the, the concept saying, saying that somebody brings in a transformation in another life, uh, I we kind of... Uh, uh, think differently on that, right? Like if that is kind of been true with the people are talking about one or two sessions, like I just was remembering about uh, uh, Ananda, 
who was the greatest disciple of Buddha was with him almost 35, 40 years. And during the lifetime of Buddha, he didn't get transformed. And after Buddha passed away, he was kind of lambending, saying that he didn't get transformed. And only then he realized it, he has to work on himself. So he got transformed. So that concept applies to all the coaches and counselees or any other person in their life. That's a very powerful sharing. And in fact, I'm uh, very excited that Buddhism and uh, experiences related to Buddhism coming up because psychedelic integration has a very close link uh, with the ways of um, how Buddhism approaches transformation. So thank you for that. I would say it's not just only Buddhism. Many other uh, even religious and philosophical ideas are very, very clearly aligned with uh, this approach. So I'm glad that it's almost like closing a loop. I We get to this point, the uh, client-centered transformation, the innate transformation at the end of this session. So I also see that uh, some of you, Vicky, Sandeep and Suparna has uh, raised your hands to maximize the uh, the session. Let's go in and I would love to hear from you uh, later on. Suparna, do you have something very okay yeah okay. yeah yeah thank you thank you so much I, I really wanted to respond to what Vishwanathan just said that there was also Angulimal uh in like when his first encounter with the Buddha and uh it's a big backstory to him that he was a ferocious uh ferocious what I mean he was the killing boy. people yeah, he was a decoy and he was killing and he had a garland of, uh, you know, uh, fingers, Angulimal. And uh, in the presence, in his encounter with the Buddha and in the presence of Buddha, he, he surrenders. And nobody saw that happening. He was so, so violent. He was so bloodthirsty and he was so full of hatred and rage that it would not have happened had he not encountered uh, a soul like the Buddha's. So I would counter Vishwanathan by saying that uh, an external agency does not change. I mean, it did. And with the same person that we were talking about. So, I'll, I'll so also... sorry, I don't want to, I don't want to eat in this time, but uh, there's a long kind of uh, debate. I have we shall take food. it. We shall take sure. it offline. But I just wanted to park sure. it here. I could could not, but sure. not respond sure. to that. Thanks, sure. Fernando. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Suparna and Visarnathana. I think it's the same thing that you are both actually talking about. It's yes. just looking at it from different perspectives. You are both actually agreeing with each other. It's just that we are looking at it from different perspectives. In fact, we are going to look at it. So I'm glad that this is coming up. Let's have a look at um, this in a moment, a minute. Now, actually, it's like if I am to quickly address this, it's the ability for that to be transformed by you. You could look at like a very, um, uh, let's say in this case, case, sacred figure and uh, to to act completely indifferently to that situation. However, in this situation of Angulimal, what is happening is that he has that belief or he has he's willing to be transformed in the presence of Buddha. So that means there's still that uh, innate capacity of transformation coming through as well. So it's, it's both. So there's a combination of there's a powerful instant um, intervention being present and also Angulimal being willing to be transformed, not to uh, see Buddha and be indifferent to that possibility. So, and yes. in, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so in, consciously he was resisting it, but unconsciously, and th th those that's an entire different conversation, is right. that uh, the, the subtle exchanges, because Buddha is, uh, is the embodiment of uh, forgiveness and loving kindness and compassion. So it is his extreme compassion that uh, you know absolutely takes care of that raging thing within uh, Angulimal, and he's able to surrender himself. Yeah. So the co-creation between, if we apply it to ourselves, it's the co-creation between the practitioner and the client is absolutely. able to take Absolutely. Right? Yes. So absolutely vital. Yeah. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, I, those can I just uh, chip in? Uh, can I just chip in if you don't mind? Just a very quick one. To my mind, transformation is an irreversible process. 
and two quick points. While every every uh, uh, change, every transformation is a change, but every change is not a transformation. So I call it the one degree phenomenon. At 99.9, .9, it is still H2O, Elvit boiling, but it's still water. So the state is liquid, but something magical happens at 100 plus, and it transforms to gas, and it doesn't come back unless it condenses. So the state of being that we are talking about, which results in a... So the Angulimal Buddha, or Buddha himself, from being Gautama, the prince, to the Buddha, he went back to the palace to meet his estranged father, Bindusara, and his wife, Yashodhara, but he could never become Gautama, the prince. So that's transformation. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant, Vicky. Thank you. I think that's exactly where this uh, session is also going in. And I think at this point of time, uh, let us look at, uh, I think you are literally kind of guiding me into this slide, literally, if you notice. So we have awareness. Often we know a lot of things, but the question is, can we actualize that awareness? So it can be applicable in many different ways, all the way from changing a specific behavior to what we call now that we are from uh, Asia. I think we are familiar with the idea of um, attainment of enlightenment, let's say, right? From a, a simple behavioral change to a, a something much larger and awakening or enlightenment. Um, so if I am to share my life story very, very briefly, uh, when I was already working as a coach and a therapist, uh, most of the time I felt like a hypocrite. The reason is very, very honestly, this is the reason why I said my heart is pounding as I say this. Um, because I was working with clients who, were, who, who wanted to break away from certain dependencies, addictions, and working with clients who were looking for that transformation. But every night after all of those sessions, I asked myself, am I creating that true transformation that I was looking for, that I was yearning? I was, I, I accessed later that I didn't even know was possible. So often we know that we can, we are aware, we know certain things, but how do we actualize it? This is the question. Now, when one of you said that it's something irreversible, I actually resonate with you. Your main, you what you mean by here is it's a vibrational alignment. It's a change that happens in your unconscious mind in a way that you can't you can't go back to it. It's an embodiment of a change. You're becoming something new vibrationally that you can't go back to it. So how I would say this now, continuing my story, um, I used to drink a lot of alcohol. There were times that I would need like 15, 20 beers will just go down my throat just so very easily and I could have like half a bottle of vodka uh, this was like about eight years ago I could just have half a bottle of vodka very easily just to get myself to sleep and then at the same time I felt like a hypocrite because I will wake up next morning I wouldn't feel a hangover because my body has become very familiar how to deal with it so I would just wake up and as if nothing happened although now I know that there was a lot of things happening uh, I would just go on to continue my work. Now I sometimes look at my images from that time and sometimes I have tears in my eyes looking at how much of suffering I went through during that time. So now when I went through my very first psychedelic integration experience, um, I had my heart opened, myself opened to, I think the best word to use is the light, is the love in a way that I never experienced the connection to everything. And there were lots of things that fell into place and got adjusted, realigned. My mind, body, consciousness, energy, energetic perception, everything got aligned, if I may say like that. And the interesting thing is that I woke up the day after and then I sat on my bed and I felt very light head, like literally, quite literally. And I thought, oh, I did the cyclic transformation yesterday and I had such a breakthrough. So it must be, th this medicine must be still in my body. The plant medicine must be still in my body. So that's why I must be feeling like this. So I woke up day two. 
I felt the same way. I thought I feel great energy. I felt like I wanted to meditate. I want to go to the gym before I get my day started, which which was very difficult for me. Very frankly speaking, something that I have to drag myself with the greatest difficulty. Day three, day four, usually the active compound of uh, psychedelics only lasts in your body for about four days very actively but it's also not necessarily active enough to create an altered state or make you feel good in such a way. But I was still believing in the truth that it's because I took this plant medicine that it's acting in my body. Day five, day six, day seven, now I know I know scientifically it is not possible for me to experience an elevated state of being on the day seven after this experience. And on the day seven, I stood up and I fell down on my knees on the floor and started crying. The reason being, that was the day I just recognized that entire my life that I could remember, I have been depressed. The entire life that I have been living, whatever that I could recall, I have been struggling and I normalized it to a state that I thought that's how every human being feels. I thought that everyone who comes out feels so hard to wake up, get up and do things. And it has become so normal to me being depressed, living in anxiety, living in so much of uh, CPTSD, uh, the, the traumatic responses that I did not know existed within me, how I disassociated from my past, how I was turning into alcohol every evening. I did not know that there was something called living a healthy, mentally healthy life. And that was such a great breakthrough for me to recognize that I was depressed all my life that I could remember. So you can imagine that day I stood up from there and decided that whatever it takes me to uh, share this message, I just felt like screaming from the roof. That's exactly how I felt. And I wanted to make calls to the world leaders and I wanted to do everything that is possible. And very soon I realized the best way to approach it is to combine it with the profession that I am part of. And then I saw the reason why I experienced everything I experienced and how everything fell into place for me to be met with this beautiful possibility. So as a result of that, I'm standing in front of you. And I think when I stood up from the floor that day and this deep intention I made is coming to a reality right now. So for me, this is what I mean by actualized awareness. Sometimes we can know, I knew clearly that drinking every night is not a good thing to do. I knew that there was something wrong with me. I knew that I was demonstrating certain dependencies, compulsive behaviors, but I knew that cognitively, I knew that cerebrally, cerebrally I could make sense of it, but I was not able to, just that thought was not enough for me to actualize that awareness and to stand up and say and ever since then I haven't taken more than two glasses of uh, something now once in a while when I'm out there I drink a glass of champagne to celebrate because I usually don't like going in an extreme now I because I lived a life of extremes all the time now I don't say no to anything so I have a glass of wine once in a while but that's also not necessarily out of a need it's just that I like to do it and celebrate with everyone and it doesn't necessarily do anything to me anymore. Sometimes I actually regret it the next day compared to how I used to have a half a bottle of vodka and then was able to wake up next morning. So this is for me is actualized awareness, changing this, it, like the way I could say that it changed me in my bones. Uh, I think vibrationally, unconsciously, it changed me just overnight and that's what really made me want to stand up in front of you and with this conviction and talk to your body. So in any way, I wouldn't say that one person creating clarity, making a behavior modification uh, is not a transformation. I think transformation is a very uh, relative word. So every change, every development, every positive thing that happens to us, we can consider as transformation. At the same time, in my life, I experience something that I can't imagine the power of that transformation as part of the integration of this medicine. So that's the reason why I'm standing in front of you, right? So in order for us to uh, talk about uh, coaching beyond the conscious mind, it's important that we look at the neuroscience of coaching and make sense. 
So with that, I would like to look at quickly our cortical brain. Now, when we saw, say cortical brain, this is the cognitive brain. In other words, the thinking part of the brain most of the time, how we make connections. At the same time, I also would like to say, when we just point in one specific part of the brain and say, this part of the brain is responsible for this, that's actually very primitive. Our brain is still is, is the organ that we still don't know much about. We are still, although we are living in 2024, there's a lot of research. I think there's so much that we still need to learn about our brain. So at the same time, however, if you look at it from the within the science that we know, um, you know that we have certain parts of our brain. So if we start with uh, prefrontal cortex. Now, when we coach our clients, we help them to make decisions or they make their own decisions through the coaching process. They start to control their stress and then they become more aware of themselves. They're able to process about who they are truly and they're able to make decisions and then uh, work within social situations. Now, this is truly making connections which we uh, can facilitate through coaching. And then if you look at ACC, anterior cingulate cortex, you are aware that uh, this is our somatic part of our cortical brain, um, which is um, which helps us to um, regulate our body, our heart rate, attention, impulsions, and so on. And then if you look at our PCC, the posterior cingulate cortex, you know that this is where the self-reflection, memory retrieval, integration of information of self come from. So if you look at these cerebral areas, the outer layer of our brain, the certain cortexes, they come together in order for us to create a cerebral, if not cognitive experience during the coaching process. But in, the, in any way, I do not say that there are no subcortical, if not unconscious brain, which is below the limbic system that you see the white color area right in the middle. Below that, all the organs we call subcortical brain, brain which is directly associated with our unconscious mind, unconscious, the programming, the trauma responses and so on. Now, in coaching, of course, we can penetrate through some of those uh, subcortical unconscious brain as well but we are all aware coaching is a very cerebral process and not necessarily directly very powerfully penetrate through our unconscious mind so moving forward now let's look at the changes to the nervous system so i'm talking about our entire nervous system including our brain now there are ways of the change happen let's look at key three changes one is long-term repeated induction of a specific behavior, specific stimuli or something like that. So for an example, if someone who grew up, the nurture part of a person, nurturing. When a person grows up in a negative environment, a uh, conflictive environment, they embody some of those conflicts, negativity in themselves. And we call them, this is called classical conditioning, if not programming. We program ourselves in the long run. And then we end up being molded to become someone of that same behavior or an opposite behavior. And this is what we recognize as long-term repeated induction of a specific behavior or a stimuli. And then there are also sudden extreme inductions of change in us. Now, for an example, when we have experienced assault, maybe um, we have been uh, abused, raped or something like that, that the it threatened our survival. It made us so fearful. Suddenly, we immediately change within ourselves. And this is also what one of you said earlier, that you cannot go back. That's why once someone is traumatized, that person is like a different person all of a sudden. They are not the same person anymore. I'm pretty sure you may have experienced people like that. And then, of course, we also know the changes to our nervous system can happen through the epigenetic inher uh, inheritance as well. Then certain uh, adverse experiences, uh, our our ancestors, like our great great uh, grandparents, great great grandparents have experienced, they can be passed down to us. And this is science. And now we have enough evidence to recognize that. So sometimes when a trigger shows up, now, if you look at this next image, which we discussed in the trauma-informed uh, session we did, uh, when the trigger shows up, this specific behavior shows up. In this case, this child becoming being traumatized by a dog shows up as an adult, although the adult knows that there's nothing to be worried about this pet dog, but they become paralyzed. Uh, the reason being that they are not no longer cerebrally, right? It's they are not, they, they can use their cerebral brain to know that they don't have to be afraid of the situation, 
but unconsciously they are triggered in a way that they are they still feel that their life is threatened in this situation because they have created a linkage which we call a trauma response and the interesting thing that we already have discussed is the trauma response is unconscious that's why you can tell someone hundred times like what i used to do don't drink it's not good for your health but i say yes 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 i know but the evening i have no control over that cerebrally cognitively i go and i still engage in the same behavior and over and over again and uh, you may have experienced similar things or you have seen people who experience these kind of things right so this is one way to address trauma. So the repeated induction of long-term possibilities that negatively impact us or sudden extreme inductions or epigenetic inher inheritance, which just show up when the trigger is present in our life is what we really call trauma, changes to the nervous system. It changes us somatically. It changes our brain chemistry. It changes our entire body and even our energetic realms as well. All right, so now with that, I would like us to recognize that often in our clients, when we work with clients during our previous session, many of you said that there you have experienced, you have experiences with clients who say that they want to do, uh, they want to break a certain behavior, they want to achieve something, but they keep coming back, going in circles, uh, not really being able to achieve this transformation that they are looking to create. So with that, we also recognize how to interpret trauma. So you recognize that there are many, these are classic trauma responses. There are hundreds of them or more than that we can write down, analyze and discuss. So here are some of them, uh, how people are sub unconsciously being controlled without their cerebral brain, right? So now we are starting to recognize. So as professional coaches, we can easily invite the client to reflect strategize the plan of action and ask them to go out there and achieve it. So to a certain extent, we are able to create transformation. Now, that is the conscious brain transformation, the conscious transformation that we were talking about. And the deeper you go, the longer you do, the more frequently you do this, then you are able to create some unconscious transformation within the client. But like in therapy world, we often say that it takes a very long time. Sometimes people go to therapy for a, for entire life uh, without necessarily having the uh, relief of their symptoms of, for an example, uh, complex post-traumatic stress, stress disorder to begin with, right? But, well, of course, we are not therapy. So we are not talking about that realm. We are talking about even certain behaviors, certain ways of thinking, that are being controlled by unconscious mind. And often we as professional coaches try to act as a catalyst for them to change. The client goes in circles where the client might end up being in um, certain disappointment, which, which acts counterintuitively, if not counterproductive to the client. Whereas coach also might feel frustrated, disappointed, even sometimes lose confidence in operating as a coach. So moving forward, I mentioned to you, Transformation is awareness, becoming actualized awareness. So where does this happen in that case? So this is where the cortical brain comes. So the limbic system and everything underneath of it, the white part, right? So these are just only few a few things that I um, thought I will share with you. But there's a lot of things that we can discuss about. At the same time, it is not really scientifically accurate to just point out to one thing and say that this is where this specific thing happens. But just for learning, Let's look at this little diagram, right? So when you look at hippocampus, memory, learning, and emotion. La during last session, I told you, if a child grew up in an environment where there was uh, neglect, abuse, um, uh, vi violence, uh, and uh, certain uh, adverse experiences, uh, they may not receive enough blood into their hippocampus because amygdala, fear response, fight and flight response is activated most of the time because the person who put them in the danger is around them. So it's a survival uh, requirement. So amygdala is always acting up, making them very anxious, creating lifelong anxiety within themselves. So they will impair their hippocampus. Literally hippocampus will grow small and they will not be able to form the right memories, learn well and form emotions. Often the as they grow up, because the adults don't understand what is happening in their life, they would pinpoint the child and say that you are not learning, you can't remember, 
you don't know how to regulate yourself and we will blame the child without truly understanding it is not necessarily learning impairment or disability it is truly the environment child is in is not conducive for their brain development so the child grows uh, grows old with a smaller hippocampus so neurologically impaired and then if you look at basal ganglia, the executive function and motor control, executive function as in deciding between, primarily speaking, deciding between the emotion and the logic. Now, that's why many people can't make decisions or they take a long time to do that. Now, those, those things indicate that they have had certain adversities or traumatic experiences growing up. And nucleus accumbens, our reward center in our brain, which is what I was talking about earlier, being addicted to alcohol, which means that I am expecting a high level of uh, stimulation of nucleus accumbens. So I am focusing on the reward mechanisms all the time. That's why that's why we cannot break the dependencies just like that consciously, because all these four parts are in our subcortical brain, and our subcortical brain directly. Influ uh, sorry, our sub subcortical brain hosts our unconscious mind. We don't have direct access to them through cerebral connection. If not, we can't just think and say, "I'm not going to be scared. I'm not. I'm. I. I should be able to learn." So, no matter how many times we would affirm, no, ma no matter how much we reflect and become clear about being able to uh, recognizing the importance of awareness, if this awareness was not actualized if the awareness the cerebral awareness was not actualized in our subcortical brain particularly some of these uh, brain components we are unable to truly transform the understanding itself could be considered as some level of transformation but we can ask as professionals uh, how, what is the extent of transformation that we want to create all right so moving forward Let's look at the other side of the story. So we said changes to the nervous system, like sudden extreme inductions, long-term uh, repeated inductions, and energy uh, gen genetics can create change the nervous system. And also, it works the other way around, right? Changes to the nervous system is also healing, which is what we call neuroplasticity. Right. So in other words, if you coach a client for a very long period of time or if you deliver psychotherapy over a very long time, if you meditated for a long time, if you did yoga for a long time. Now, these enable our clients or individuals to transform themselves by repeating the same thing over and over again, because repetition is how we program our mind. And you all know that. So that means through repetition, we are able to influence our subcortical brain, for an example. But we understand that it could take a very, very long time to happen. And then also there are sudden extreme inductions. Like for an example, I could say breath work is one of the experiences. And another one could be having certain uh, apparent, uh, let's say someone is addicted to a specific substance and they lose someone very close to their family. It is both, it's both traumatic and can also be healing. After that experience, they come out and say, I will never drink again. And they actually would do that. Why? Because there's a sudden extreme induction into our brain, into our nervous system that that interacted with the subcortical brain, certain components, so that they were able to heal. In other words, during this experience, they increase their neuroplasticity to a greater extent. But what does neuroplasticity mean? The adaptability, if not the ability to change and transform in the positive direction is what we call neuroplasticity. So the sudden extreme induction can also be helpful. And also at the same time, when we uh, are able to trigger certain uh, genetic information of our ancestors within ourselves, then we are also able to heal. Or when we are able to, either through repetition or sudden induction, if we also can heal our ancestors, if not the genetics that had been passed on to, we also can heal. So you are starting to recognize this interesting uh, pyramid is always acting both ways. Our brain is, our nervous system is a very volatile thing. It's always changing. The states of being is always changing. And that's also the greatest advantage we have. So now you understand it from a neuroplasticity. Now, if we look at, uh, as I mentioned, there are many different ways of increasing the neuroplasticity. So I just mentioned meditation is a long-term one. Kundalini can be either long-term one or you can have a Kundalini activation in just that very moment and then create a transformation within themselves instantaneously, which is a sudden extreme induction. Breathwork 
also like for an example now that uh, you're all uh, most of you are from asia uh, and india uh, anapana right for an example so really uh, going through the breath work for a very long time can help people to change at the same time breath work intense breath work also cre could create uh, immediate changes and another one is that what we are discussing today which is psychedelics and psychedelics have immense power so now let's talk about going beyond the conscious mind and how the psychedelic integration works i would like to say that uh, we don't have enough time during this very short session today but if we really look at the certain parts of our brain some of the ones that we just discussed it's the same parts that meditate meditation impact the psychedelics impact as well and I promise you at the end of the session, I will close this feedback loop by sharing with you a quote of one of my teachers, a uh, world-renowned psychedelic uh, professional. Uh, now, uh, meditation and psychedelic influence the same areas of the brain. One of the main differences is that meditation does it very slowly and it takes a long time to reach higher states of meditational practices or embodiments in order to impact our subcortical brain or the unconscious mind. Whereas psychedelics gives us immediate immersion into our subconscious mind because we literally shut down our cerebral cortex. So let's see what this really means. Now, psychedelic word is originated in Greece and Greek origins. It means psyche, delos or delon. It truly means, psyche means soul or mind, and delon means to manifest, to become visible. So psychedelic literally means mind or the soul manifesting or becoming visible. And it is absolutely true. If you have had psychedelic experiences, I know that you're shaking your head right now. So today I would like to particularly address this specific um, psychedelic that I use, which is psilocybin. Uh, and the common name that you know of this uh, beautiful fungi is uh, magic mushrooms. If not, um, um, hallucinogenic mushrooms, let's say, right? And if you notice, uh, cultures, psilocybin, magic mushrooms, come out of cow dung, rhino dung, elephant dung, just to begin with, all right? Also, of course, wood. And they are in many tropical countries. If you just walk around your home, if you're coming from a tropical place, you will easily find psilocybin in your environment. Now, we need to understand something with this. This, the, These mushrooms have the capability to heal us instantaneously when, when introduced into uh, integration, deep reflection. Now, they are in our ecosystem. And that hints us something that they are meant for us. But unfortunately, of course, uh, the world is not necessarily always on the agenda of healing of the human civilization. There are other agendas like uh, making money, keeping the wars running so more money can be made. Uh, some pharmaceutical companies have their own agendas. Politicians have their own agendas. So there's, a, and also, of course, many of the systems wouldn't want people to be uh, aware of the reality. The systemic thinking might break down. So there's a lot of reasons why, uh, for an example, uh, there was war against drugs somewhere in 1960s, and they included psychedelics into that purposely to make sure that people will have no access to it. So now there's a lot of stigma around it, and now we have to make it legalized in order to be able to access this extremely powerful healing uh, fungi that's just out there in our environment. I'm not going to talk about this much, but I would like to share with you the power of it. Now, this is the Drug Harm Index in the UK. This is an independent scientific committee uh, on drugs. And if you look at these drugs uh, index in terms of their harmfulness, you see alcohol and heroin are the top most harmful substances. And they have all the impairments of drugs in this specific category, up to 72% alcohol. And alcohol is legal. And we like often systems would like to have problems in the world so that they can be controlled. But on the other hand side, if you look at the last one on this uh, graph, it's mushrooms, magic mushrooms particularly, and it's on the sixth. Now, what is this impairment? When you take magic mushrooms, it changes you psychologically and neurologically, literally. You are not necessarily in a state of going out there, interacting with people or driving a car, for an example. So the psychological and neurological impairment is the only impairment that is recognized. And do you also know that magic mushrooms and many other psychedelics are not addictive? 
in fact magic mushroom is not addictive at all and it's scientifically proven um, and it only holds a very little danger to human uh, to look at it scientifically moving forward so what is magic mushrooms excuse me so magic mushroom uh, psilocybin is a scientific name and when you ingest uh, psilocybin is the compound in it is psilocin and when you ingest it you don't need to prepare it in any specific way you can just ingest it well, once you ingest it it breaks down in our body and it becomes a psilocin molecule and psilocin molecule is very similar to the structure of the serotonin molecule what does that really mean the serotonin receptors are able to accept psilocin uh, molecules just like it is made for it it's almost like the the, there is the lock inside of us and the key is in the nature. And we don't even have to do a specific preparation. Once we intake psilocin, uh, we transform. So let's find out what this transformation is. So as coaches, I'm aware that you already, I, I believe that you're already aware of default mode network, which in, induces this sense of self. The sense of self, like the first time uh, you, you open your eyes, your parents started calling you with a name. And you were just a blank slate with genetic material from your great, great grandparents, great ancestors, right? You were just born to this world with actually you're a mixture of, match and mixture of your great grandparents truly when you were born. And also the experiences that you had in mom's womb itself, whether, you're, whether your parents are loving and kind or whether they lived in a turbulent environment. Now you are a result of that. And then you just come out of it you have no name, you don't know a religion of yourself, you are not associated with profession, profession or anything like that. You don't know any of your society, the, whether you, you, you should behave in a specific way, you should speak in a specific language, you have no knowledge of any of that. You're a blank, almost a blank slate. And then what happens? People start telling you who you are. So you start building sense of self. You, you had no religion, you had no society, you had no name, but now it was given to you. And it is necessary in order for us to be able to operate in this 3D reality, uh, in order for us to maintain our consciousness. So you build your default mode network. Our brain has specific areas, which you see on this diagram, are the ones that hold to remember who you truly are. And isn't that so very interesting? In our entire body, there are just very few places in our brain uh, also certain ner ner nervous systems that remembers who you are. In case if you were able to safely remove them, which psilocybin does, all of a sudden, you don't remember who you are. You cannot recall your name anymore. You cannot recall your society, the lang even language sometimes. Right. So moving forward, we need to start to recognize. Now, when we work with our um, default mode network, it goes beyond our cerebral cortex. Now, if we turn it into colors, let me show you a diagram between how much our brain is connected during our normal state of being, like all of us are right now. And then while you have taken psilocybin, how much your brain is connected. So here we are. Diagram A is the colors that you see here. Think about it as a representation of different cortexes in this diagram. So different colors you see around are different cortexes. In a normal situation, our we call it sober brain, uh, placebo brain. We we have a some level of connections, and this is day to day connections. Whether you are taking an exam, whether you are coaching someone, whether you are beginner to meditation or anything like that. But if you look at diagram B, this is psilocybin brain. The moment when the uh, when we take the when the serotonin receptors accept. Uh, psilocin molecules, uh, your default mode network dissolves ego death. And this is something very familiar to most of us as Asians because we understand that needing to uh, conquer our ego, if you hear, right? So uh, even certain philosophies that came out during the discussion uh, lead us in the direction of the importance of being able to look at the world without ego, without looking at everything through the sense of self because sense of self was induced on you. It's not who you are. In other words, for the very first time in your life, you, you receive a moment of opportunity through psychedelic integration to experience that blank slate for genetic material without wearing all the glasses that you learn through the journey of your life. So that moment, your brain connects like ever before 
And I think this is a real diagram, uh, MRI image uh, represented infographically, absolutely scientific uh, diagram. Now, when we talk about transformation through psychedelic integration, there are three key principles. The preparation, we need to prepare for the ex experience, and then we go through the transcendental experience, which is the ego death. You remove your sense of self and you look at the universe and look at yourself for the very first time without involvement of your name, your age, your occupation and everything else that you know about because you literally cannot recall any of that during this experience. I mean, you can come back to consciousness if you needed to like very easily. But when we induce this state, there are specific ways of doing that where you are able to disengage from your sense of self very safely and experience the entire universe for something very different that you have never ever experienced before. And then, of course, there is integration protocol that needs to happen, integrating this very abstract experience into reality, into development and into your transformation. So this is the transformation that happens through uh, psilocybin or the psychedelic integration particularly. Now, what I would do is let me allow me to share one of my experiences. Let's begin with the question. Have you ever seen through the eyes of your mind? The eyes of your mind, not the eyes of your physical body. The eyes of the physical body is looking at me or the screen right now. But the eyes of your mind is a different experience because when you don't have sense of self, your eyes of the body are not processing the outside world the same way that you used to process it. It just dilutes, everything dilutes. We start to see the reality for a specific way that it can be. Now, the reality that you're experiencing is a specific way based on your sense of self and your sensory perception, you're recognizing it. But once there is no sensory perception or when you don't have sense of self, all of a sudden, everything that is around you start to change. So let me give you a little bit of, an, a little bit of my experiences with seeing myself and the universe through the eyes of my mind, not through the I saw my body. So one day, I can talk about this all night or many days, but I share just one experience. One day I have taken, and I'm going into, in a guided setting, I'm going into the experience. As I go into it, within the first 20 minutes, I'm chanting, I'm meditating, I'm uh, letting myself lose my sense of self. So I first feel a little bit disorientated and then I start to see some really beautiful fractals. And then at some point I feel like there's like an engine, uh, my, my conscious, uh, my sense of self is now dying away or temporarily disconnecting from my body and mind. Now, when this happens, I feel like there's like an engine like accelerating and at some point, I comfortably let go of that. So I first felt, I fell into like a fabric of love that just took me in. And as I just went in there, I get goosebumps as I'm speaking. I just go in there and then I felt like I was in a world of toys, like a childlike energy. It's not, I didn't see any toy, but I felt like I was child. I felt like I was in my mom's womb. I felt like a very caring, nurturing energy around me. That's why I put all these beautiful, it's like I fell into this mountain of toys in happiness and it took me in. It's almost like at that moment, my feeling was, um, I, I felt like the way I found love or the way, how hard it is for us to find love uh, in this existence is almost like finding a needle in a haystack. In this experience, I felt like there was no haystack. The, the needle was right in the middle of it. I just could see and I could only see the needle. It was so new, natural. The love was so natural. I was embraced in it. And with that, I recognized that for a second, I was disoriented. I couldn't remember Fernando. I couldn't remember my name. So I hardly had my, my cognitive processes are still slightly active. So I'm asking, who am I? Who am I? And then comes up a wave of Fernando. And you often hear when people go through transcendental experiences, like near-death experiences, the life flashes in front of them. Now, before that, I just got a sense of who Fernando is. With that, I felt like I'm covered in a beautiful flower. The sensory experience was as if I'm in the middle of a beautiful flower and I could 
feel the fragrance. I could feel, I could touch something that I couldn't touch necessarily. I felt like I'm part of something so magnificent, something so beautiful, something so beautifully colorful, but I couldn't necessarily make sense what it was. A very comfortable feeling. And with that, I went in one more time and then my life splashed in front of my eyes. It's not necessarily incidental, but it was like a sense of who Fernando was. All my hardships, all the trauma that I have been through, all the assault I experienced, all the bullying I grew up with, um, and many the, the the experiences of my parents, experiences of my ancestors, very surprisingly just flash in front of my eyes just in a millisecond. It's so beautiful because, again, the time is a perception when we have our sensory, within that experience, sometimes it could feel like a million years, sometimes it could be like one second. So it may have been just a minute, I don't even know, but I felt like I just knew my life. Somehow I had this deeper awareness and all the way to my death. I just I just felt like I knew my future. I knew that I'm going to be meeting you. I knew I was going to be good, do this. It's such a beautiful, magical experience. And then there came the moment that Fernando disappeared completely. And trust me, at that moment, I asked myself again, who am I? After that flashing in front of eyes, I recognized that it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It's just something that I wore, like a cloak. It's just something that people gave me, and it just doesn't matter. And at the moment I accepted it, I started to notice how I could see that, that my body is recycled material from tiger teeth from a wood, from the beautiful elements of the nature that I am not just myself, that I'm something truly, truly, truly recycled. Such a beautiful, very comforting and a very loving experience. And then at, with that, I just expanded into the entire universe. I just felt myself in the entire universe. I felt in you. I felt in every tree. I felt in every animal. I can't explain how I, how I could experience it, but it's like just becoming like a singularity, just one moment in your life. So powerful, so connected that you recognize that love and uh, the hate if not negative positive or pain and pleasure are actually the boundaries of our human experience and what makes us suffer is the attachment to this what we perceive as pain perceive as pleasure but truly it is an experience required pain is required for us to survive pleasure is required for us to be able to experience the pain yet live that there's enough pleasure. Like when the mothers embrace, one would live for the mother's embrace. So they would swim hundred oceans. The reason being they would take that pain because that they know there is love. But if there was only love on one side of the picture, then there is no reason for us to live because there's play only pleasure. We don't see the difference that there is existence of pain. So the pain and the pleasure need to coexist in the universe. And I recognize that I don't have to perceive and say that this is good for me. This is bad for me. Rather, become an observer. Be non-attached to the pain, non-attached to pleasure as they occur. Be in that moment and recognize that I'm experiencing pain right now. I'm experiencing pleasure right now. But there is no need for me to attach myself because if I did, then the hurt occurs, then the suffering occurs. Now, this was such a magnificent feeling and I felt like I'm connected to everything. I knew what I came, came here to looking for or something that I was looking for all my life, I found out. So as a child, I my mom says that I used to be very curious. I asked weird questions and I think that's what brought me to become a coach. And that day, I had my answers. It doesn't mean I had necessarily every answer, every question was answered, but innately I connected the dots in a way that I no longer needed the answers. I already knew what I wanted to know. I knew that all these things is actually part of just being my consciousness, which is your consciousness that we are sharing this consciousness and we see the separation in our human bodies. And then with that human body, we attach ourselves to either pain or pleasure, which, generate, which generates suffering, right? So this state of connectedness, this state of uh, 
possibility of connection in our brain enables just within ourselves finding magnificent possibilities. Now, this is just only one example. I myself have been through so many exam experiences and created many different breakthroughs. And every time I go in, I come out with something new, fascinating, and it keeps changing me vibrationally. It keeps changing me vibrationally. So you are starting to recognize why I was able to just look away from alcohol. The next day, I just, I had a nice cabinet of alcohol and it was just hanging there for a very long time until we had a big party because I no longer, I could just have it in my hand. I could smell it, but I didn't have the need to drink anymore. And then that day, after the seventh day, I stood up and said, all right, now I am ready to treat my clients. Now I walk the talk. So I would say that when we are able to create this sudden extreme induction with psychedelic integration, which is part of the preparation and the integration, we are able to create that change within ourselves. Not just only that goes within our cerebral mind, but it goes into our unconscious mind. This session is about coaching beyond the conscious mind. So with that, I would like to invite you to recognize that awareness, becoming actualized awareness requires a vibrational change that we can go back to again. We know a greater truth. We have embodied it. We have become this greater truth. We have unconsciously transformed that awareness has become now actualized as a living proof. In science world or therapy world, often therapists refer to it like this. If your mind is a snow mountain, often we use the same paths, the neural networks to access and do the same things. Our brain is a lazy machine. So we stick to the same path. However, when you go through psychedelic integration, we increase the neuroplasticity in such a way that it's almost like the new snowfall that we can look at the entire mountain for the very first time, most of the time in our life, and then start creating new paths. Right. Just to give you a little bit of clinical understanding, we are coming to an end, so I'll try to manage time. Uh, so depression study at the uh, Center for Psychedelics at John Hopkins say 70% clinical significant improvement and 50% full remission within one month follow-up. And cancer study, six months follow-up, there is more than about 70% of uh, uh, improvement and remission in people. So now you might say, Fernando, this is related to therapy. This is about therapeutic. How about coaching? How about healthy mindset? So let me show you. You know that 50% of the people say that it is the most meaningful spiritual experience. 80% of the people say it is the most spiritual and personally meaningful experience. And 90% of the people um, share after just one session that their life satisfaction, positive behavior changes, relationships, and everything has improved overnight. Now, this is the study with healthy individuals. And that's exactly my experience. So this 80% of the people who say that it's the most personally meaningful or spiritual meaningful experience, we need to ask them, what are some other, this level of spiritually or personally meaningful experiences? Do you know that they compare psychedelic experience to death of their child or birth of their child or death of their mother? So you can imagine the power of just one experience can hold. All right. And it's exactly the same. Like the, apart from loving the people that I love the most in my life, uh, this experience is the highest, most valuable experience for me, frankly speaking. I think I'm not going to do a reflective exercise in terms of key takeaways. I'm going to invite you to, uh, as a group, uh, reflection because I think we will run out of time. The best is I invite you to do a um, reflection by yourself, like self-reflection, and share a few of your thoughts. Right. So before we conclude this, since we have an engagement with the coaching, I would like to share with you why professional coaches are perfectly, perfectly suited to offer psychedelic integration with necessary training, of course trauma-informed and psychedelic integration, entire protocol and understanding the world, also having experienced within themselves. The first reason is the coach is comfortable not knowing as one of the best states to expand awareness. These are MCC competency and you're familiar with this. Now, because this experience, the answers come within yourself. It's so powerful that the sudden induction creates massive value in us that the answers, like me as a practitioner in this field, when someone is going through this experience, 
I just remain completely outside the process because they, I call it super positioning. They get into their super position and they start to see themselves in a very different light that they never ever saw before. So it's the best. Mostly I have seen a uh, psychologist, therapist and psychiatrist struggle with this because often in this world, basically there's a, the psychologist or the therapist in most cases are the expert. There's a specific way of telling the client or following a strategy in order for the client to get better. So they struggle. But when you work with coaches, as I train coaches, I see that they embody this so naturally, so beautifully. We understand that. Another one, coach does not force awareness or coach has not concluded what awareness should be because awareness is something, consciousness is something that we can define or we cannot decide it for someone else. It's extremely powerful and our clients find out. And coach trust that value is inherent in the process. Coach doesn't have to create value or work hard. And psychedelic integration, the innate power that we find within ourselves is more than enough for the client to transform without the practitioner having to tell, you would do this, you would do that. And coach is able to recognize both their and client's ability of intuition and energetic perception. In the clinical world, often, the clinicians are unable to approach this with intuition and an energetic per perception, the metaphysical aspects of it. We have to approach it clinically most of the time because of the clinical barriers. But as professional coaches, this is an ICF competency. So that means ICF encourages us to engage our intuition, energy perception. That means there's an environment that is already safe for professional coaches to operate within this metaphysical aspects of psychedelic integration, which cannot be simply measured by science. I would say often we think we measure the universe by our science. Actually, the, the truth is that we live in a metaphysical universe and we just use these tiny, tiny, tiny molecular lenses as science to look outside. But we truly live in an enormous universe of metaphysics that often we are blind to because we are conditioned by our upbringing that if we can't reason, if we can't understand, we wouldn't accept it or we wouldn't feel comfortable. And as professional coaches, however, though, we are comfortable in operating in a place of unknown. All right. So I would like you to invite, I'd like to invite you to a bit of a reflection. So what are your insights and key takeaways from this session? So with that, I will share my last slide so that we can hear from some of you before we end this session, which would be great. So like I mentioned earlier, I said the meditation practice and psychedelic integration impact the same areas of our brain and our nervous system. And after psychedelic integration, I started a practice of Vipassana by myself. Through Vipassana, I think you would be able to resonate with me because I believe there are many Vipassana meditators in this room for sure. There had been times without any psychedelics because of the change of my clarity of my mind, I have been able to go to deeper states of minds where I was able to access my heart outside of my body, the layers and layers of energy existence. And what does that each layer tell me about myself, about my environment? And I have been able to access the crown of existence of my own brain so amazingly. I have been able to have experiences out of my body, connect with people that I never thought would be able to connect, forgive myself deeply, forgive other people deeply so much and in tune my intuition in a way. Sometimes people ask like, are you like a medium? Do you channel? I usually say, no, no, you need to find your own answers. So uh, I would like to share with you this saying by Roland Griffiths one of my teachers who passed away last year, unfortunately. So he says, I have come to think of meditation and psilocybin have been complementary practices for investigation of the nature of mind. In fact, neuroimaging studies show that they both produce similar changes in brain regions related to sense of self. Now hear me out. Well, if the meditation represents the true cause of the inves investigation of the mind, Psilocybin surely represents the crash cause. I repeat, if meditation represents the true cause of the in investigation of the mind, psilocybin surely represents the crash cause. If I put this into layman's terms, his studies included people who have been through psilocybin, people who have been through 20 years, 25 years, 30 years of meditation. We call them professional meditators. And then they went through psilocybin experiences. 
And those people who have had the meditation experience and psilocybin experience, they say they can't even compare the states they were able to reach with meditation in comparison to the states that psilocybin could create. So now you are starting to recognize why psilocybin is considered as a crash course in terms of, in terms of investigation of our mind. <laughs> so thankful to Roland Griffiths for all the hard work he has put in. And with that, I would like to bring uh, the attention back to all of you and would love to hear from some of you your insights on how you are receiving this message. Over to you. There were a couple of questions in the chat, uh, Fernando. All right. Pradeep had asked. Uh, All right. Vicky, uh, go ahead. I'll, I'll have to read yeah, out. Yeah, OK. Uh, thanks. Uh, so you know, uh, this was a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, presentation, uh, Fernando. Uh, two or three questions. I've been, uh, I have not, uh, <clears throat> see in India, this is banned, okay? Uh, we have still not legalized this. But what I've been following is apart from uh, meditation, also I have been doing the psychotropic breath work to come closer to that state. So my question to you is twofold. I mean, uh, one is, uh, because I'm familiar with the work of uh, Stanislav Grof, and he had done a lot of work with LSD in the 60s, <clears throat> and there were amazing results that he got, you know. But the question I have for you is that if supposing there is someone who has underlying psychopathology, okay, and if there is <clears throat> a bipolar disorder or somebody's on psychiatric medications, then would you advise this induction of this kind of substances? Uh, Vicky, thank you. Yes. Very quickly, I'll address that. So there is a very strong uh, protocol in terms of screening before a coach accepts a client. So for a coach, if there's any underlying uh, mental conditions are detected through the tests or based on the very thorough screening process we do, it's absolutely not recommended. In this case, we will have to uh, refer the client to a, a psychedelic assisted therapist who will also work with a medical doctor or a psychiatrist during the session, they can take the sessions, but it could catalyze a psychosis. So because of this reason, they will have to have mm -hmm. the uh, advanced, if not heightened level of accountability and monitoring while it is happening. Thank you for asking that very No, I, I mean, thanks. I, I didn't ask this as a coach. Yeah. I asked this question as a psychotherapist. Yes. So, so mm -hmm. because that's an area which is a very gray area here. So I wasn't clear about it. But thanks for the response. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. So there are also certain um, medication substances that one can be pulled out of this state very quickly. I wouldn't mention any names here, but uh, if you would like to, I'm very happy to share with you. So we cannot administer, even as a clinical psychologist, we cannot administer, I mean, well, we cannot administer anything as a clinical psychologist. So we can have a, a, a psychi psychiatrist or a medical doctor who can uh, help with this situation. Thank you. And then I see from Madhumati. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I cannot put on my video because my uh, uh, internet connection is unstable. Uh, thank you for a wonderful session. Uh, just wanted to share my uh, experience and position the transformation. Uh, so basically, I think at this point of time, I'm exploring everything. <laughs> Uh, Mita, you're not audible. Except ingest, uh, share, uh, what are uh, type, <coughs> type you know, practices which are available? Uh, except anything which doesn't do something. You know? Madam Mita, uh, do do you mean uh, any practices without ingestion of anything? Is that what you mean? Yeah, like, uh, like that, yeah, like that, uh, I mean, I mean, what I understood is uh, integrated coaching, uh, there is a requirement of eating something, right? Mm. As in feeding yourself something, um, like a mushroom or whatever. So I'm exploring currently, like, the various trauma-informed uh, coaching uh, options available 
which do not involve eating or drinking anything you know yeah yes of course there are many like somatic exercises yoga meditation kundalini practices breath work uh, certain like uh, psychotherapy practices that can help a client to go deeper uh, like even something like hypnotherapy to begin with, like some level of uh, deepening to theta level stage. Yeah, possible. And thank you. And let's hear from Amlesh. And then I will hand it over to um, Shanti. Yeah. Shanti, Thanks. if you would like to take insights question, I'll let you do that as uh, we have already passed one minute. Over to you, Amlesh. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Fernando. Uh, excellent session. A lot of learning. Uh, my question is that, you know, neuro-linguistic programming does have uh, tools and techniques to cure phobia and addiction. The two aspects that you primarily took up today to uh, build the case for psychedelic uh, integration. So uh, have you tried comparing or is there any comparison available? Uh, I, I'm not trying to say for and against kind of a, I mean, it's, more for the sake of that at what level uh, possibly only NLP can work. Uh, you know what something that Madhumita was saying that without ingesting something. Uh, so at what level NLP possibly alone can work and uh, moving forward possibly uh, psychedelic integration will be more useful and so on and so forth. So since okay. you have worked in this area, possibly you will have more clarity and that will be helpful to me. Absolutely. Amlesh, so I will not be very specific about NLP as such. If we even compare some of the most advanced psychotherapy practices that are more scientific compared to NLP, for an example, which has like a clinical framework, cannot be compared. It's impossible. There's no, like, I would, I, if you don't mind, since we are all adults, in the therapeutic world, there's this little saying. It's almost like doing psychotherapy for years is almost like having sex without lubricant mm -hmm. uh, in comparison to uh, mm -hmm. sorry about that mm -hmm. but uh, that's what we usually say it as a joke mm -hmm. uh, it cannot be compared the state that you experience is something out of this world and that's why we call it magical and um, the mind manifesting seeing it through the mind it cannot be compared with even some of the most advanced uh, psychotherapy <clears throat> therapy practices yeah thank you so yeah. over to you thank Shanti. You. if you would like to take insights i'll let you do that so once again thank you very much everyone and thank you icf bangalore chapter for having me it's such an honor to be in your presence thank you absolute pleasure fernando the session has been brilliant uh, you can see the chat overflowing with so much of gratitude i know we've got a couple of hands and i will pause recording and fernando if you've got time to answer absolutely uh, just before we wrap up for those who are Still here on the call, I had pasted the links for the upcoming two sessions uh, from the Bengaluru chapter in the chat. Looking forward to seeing as many of you possible uh, to join in the upcoming sessions. With that, I will pause the recording. Um,